All right, welcome back. So today we're going to continue talking about sorting. Sorting was the new challenge that we introduced last time. The basis, it's an algorithm that forms the basis of a lot of other algorithms that, or approaches to working with data that we see in use. And this is a, a real problem. Um, and it's also a great chance for us to bring together a lot of the things we've done this semester. So we're going to do some iterative programming, we're going to do some recursive programming, uh, we're going to be able to apply our big O analysis to the sorting algorithms that we come up with, and talk about trade-offs between different ways of solving the same problem. All right, so but I want to start out by just, you know, saying a, a, a word here about the fact that the class is doing really well. So I was um, up uh, pretty late on Monday night working on the lab, and as I was preparing the lab, I was sort of thinking like, oh, this is, you know, it, it felt like a good idea when I started working on it. And then as I was going along, I was like, this is way too hard. You know, nobody's going to get it. Um, you know, I'm going to, there's going to be all sorts of complaining on the forum about how difficult this lab is and stuff like that. And then you guys did the lab. Um, you know, many of you, many of you, you know, were able to do it. A lot of you, I think, got pretty close. So I was really impressed by that. Congratulations. Um, the lab will be open again this weekend if you want to take another shot at it, uh, particularly for sort of getting that last little piece of it. Um, but again, so I was, I was impressed, right? This was something that I wasn't sure whether you'd be able to do at this point in the semester, and I think many of you were able to do it, um, and so I feel like that's a great sign. Uh, MP4 also seems to be going well. Keep in mind you have a deadline coming up on Monday. Um, if you haven't started MP4, I'm worried about that, but we have office hours today and this weekend as usual. So congrats, keep up the good work. We have about a month left, we're gonna get through MP4, uh, we're gonna get through some of the stuff in the next couple weeks, and then you're gonna be working on your final project, and it's gonna be fun and, and things like that, right? Spring is coming. All right, so as a reminder, we're gonna discuss multiple ways to solve this problem. So putting things in order, sorting. There are a bunch of classic canonical algorithms in this space. We're not gonna talk about all of them, we don't have time. Um, but we'll talk about some of them. So today we're gonna to talk about insertion sort. Uh, that's first on the menu. Um, and then um, selection sort, we may have you guys look at in lab next week. We'll also try to get to merge sort today. I'm not sure how far we'll get, but um, if not, we'll pick up there on Monday. Um, heap sort is another way to do this. You know, there's, there's a Wikipedia page with like 50 different sorting algorithms, right? So there's uh, something called BOGO sort. Does anyone know what BOGO sort is? Yeah. Yeah, so we know how to check whether or not a, a list is sorted, right? So BOGO sort is essentially put the items in random order and check to see if they're sorted. If not, put them in random order again, right? And just continue, this is like how a, how a monkey would sort something, right? Although the monkey wouldn't be able to tell whether or not it was sorted, so that's a difficult algorithm even for a monkey to implement. But, but anyway, so these, these, some of these are fun, right? Bubble sort we'll do in, in lab next week. All right, and again, as last time I pointed out, I mean, this is a space where we're still seeing people come up with new approaches. So the default built-in sorting algorithm that's used by Python now, and I think Java and some other languages, is this sorting algorithm called TimSort, which is named after Tim, the guy who invented TimSort. TimSort is a kind of a, a combination of several other sorting algorithms that does really well in certain common cases with working with data. So for example, it's common to sort data that's almost sorted. So most of the array or most of the list might be in order, but there might be one or two elements that are out of place. Tim sort does quite well in those situations. And that's one of the reasons why it's been adopted as the default sorting algorithm by several uh, uh, major programming languages, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about insertion sort. So again, we're gonna sort arrays of integers. We're gonna sort them in ascending order. And the first algorithm we're gonna talk about is something called insertion sort. So the way you can think about insertion sort is that insertion sort divides the array in, into two parts. As insertion sort goes on, what happens is there's a part of the array that's sorted that initially starts out empty. And there's a part of the array that's still unsorted that initially starts out as the entire array. And what I do is, one at a time, I pick an element from the unsorted part of the array and I move it into the sorted part. Now when I do this, I have to make sure that the sorted part stays sorted. So the insertion part of insertion sort is making sure that I insert the element from the unsorted part into the right spot 
in the sorted section so that the sorted part stays sorted. Um, the unsorted part I don't care about. I can take any element from the unsorted part I want, but in order to maintain this property of the sorted part, which is that it's sorted, I have to put it in the right spot. Now, if I do that over and over again, what happens is every time I move something from the unsorted part to the sorted part, the unsorted part gets one element smaller, the sorted part gets one element bigger, and I'm one element closer to solving the problem. So when I start, the unsorted part has all the elements. One at a time, I move them into the sorted part. Once the unsorted part is empty, the sorted part contains all the elements and is sorted, and I'm finished. All right, so let's look at how this, this, this works um, in my little diagram here, okay? So let's say I, let's say I start with, um, now of course I can always start as a tiny little optimization, I can start with the, uns the sorted part being the first element because an array of size one is sorted. So here imagine that I start, you know, I can very easily move the first item into the sorted part of the array. Okay, so now I've got my sorted part that has one element and my unsorted part that has seven elements. Now in the next step, I'm taking item five out of, here with this particular implementation, I'm gonna take the part from the, the item from the leftmost part of the unsorted portion. So I'm taking item five and I'm sticking it into the sorted part. And notice that when I did that, I had to put it in the right spot. So in this case, I put it in front of item eight because I'm sorting in ascending order. So now I've gotta deal with item seven. Item seven goes in between the two items. So again, I've moved an item from the unsorted part into the sorted part, putting it in the right spot. Now I'm gonna deal with item three, now I'm gonna deal with item four, now I'm gonna deal with item 11. Item 11 stays put because it's the largest element I've seen. So it turns out that it's already in the right spot. Um, now I'm gonna deal with item six. Item six ends up kinda right in the middle here. And finally, I'm gonna insert item one. Sorry, item, the item with value negative one. So I'm done now. Every step of this, back up a few steps, I'm taking the item from the leftmost part of the unsorted part of the array, but again, I could take any item. I could take the item from the rightmost part. I could take a random item out of the unsorted portion of the array, and I'm inserting it into the sorted part. I do this one at a time. Uh, once I'm done, my unsorted part is now empty. It's been decreasing by one item every time and my sorted part is now the size of the entire array. It's been increasing by one item every time, and the array is now sorted. Okay, so let's zoom in and look at one specific step. Right, so in e each step we take the first item from the sorted part and insert it into the unsorted part. So here I'm highlighting the part that we're taking out, and the green is showing you where it ended up. And again, the, the part that I remove, the item that I remove from the unsorted part, can end up in a variety of different places in the sorted part of the array. Sometimes it has to go all the way to the front, sometimes it's already at the back because it's the largest or the smallest element. Um, it depends on the value of that item. But in each step, you know, this is the item I'm working with, and then it ends up here. Now I'm looking at this guy, and it ends up all the way at the front. Okay. So now let's zoom in, because the, the question, you know, on, on a high level, this seems like it works fine, but now the question becomes, how do I actually do this, right? So this is kind of, what we've been looking at here is the outer loop of the algorithm, but how do I actually implement this part where I'm taking the item and putting it in the right spot? How do I actually do the insertion? So let's look at one insertion. So here, I'm at a point where my sorted part of the array already has six elements in it. And the element that I'm trying to insert has value six. All right, so, so here's what I'm gonna do. This is basically what we're gonna implement in a minute. I'm going to start, I'm gonna take item six, and I'm essentially gonna start comparing it. I'm gonna start at the right side of my uh, sorted part of the array. I could also start at the left side. And I'm gonna start comparing it with the elements in the sorted part of the array. And the question I'm asking, since I'm, uh, I'm sorting here in ascending order, is, is six, is 11 larger than six? It is, correct? And so I know that six has to move farther to the left, right? So I'm finding the right spot to insert. So I keep going, okay? So now I compare six and eight. 
is eight larger than six? It is. And so I need to keep going. So I'm, I'm gonna move six farther to the left. Now I compare six and seven. Is seven larger than six? It is. So I keep going. So now, oops, too fast. So now I'm looking at six and five. Now I'm gonna say, is five larger than six? The answer is no. And now what I've done is I found the right spot for this element in the array. And now I can drop it in. So I start at the right side of the sorted part of the array, and I compare one at a time, moving to the left, until I find an item that's smaller than or equal to the item that I'm trying to insert. And at that point, I stop, and I know that I found the right spot to insert my new item. Questions about this? Makes perfect sense. All right, well, let's try to, let's try to implement it, okay? This is the part of the semester where, I'll see if I can really be able to do these things um, on the fly. Okay, so, so right now, I have a method here for us to work on called insertion sort. It takes an array of ints, you guys are gonna get a chance to do this uh, as a homework problem, I think, using comparables on Monday, um, but the principle is pretty much the same. All right, so about an array of ints, I'm gonna return uh, an array of ints, and the question is, how do, how do I implement this, okay? So, I'm not gonna handle, um, you know, corner cases here. You could, although, why, why not? Let's, let's handle corner cases. So let's say, if input array is equal to null, or input array dot length, is less than or equal to one, return input array. So if you pass me a null reference, it's always good to check, or if the array is size zero or one. Because if it's size one, I'm done. I don't have to do anything. If it's size one, it is sorted by default, so I don't have to do any work. Okay, so now to, to, to get insertion sort to work, I really have two, I have two loops. I have an outer loop that drives that process. So the outer loop is essentially moving one item into the sorted part um, in each step. So I'm gonna say for int i is equal to, I think it's one, i is less than input array dot length, i plus plus. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, start. So i is the starting point of the sorted part of the array. And again, this is a small optimization, I'm starting at one, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna allow the sorted part of the array to start with one element in it, because that's fine, because I know that if I put an element into it, it's still sorted. Okay, so now, so that's the loop that's going to move an item, so actually now I have to do the actual insertion. So now I have an inner loop, and my inner loop's a little tricky. So my inner loop's gonna start at i, I have an index that's starting at i, and I'm working my way uh, backwards here. So remember, when I go through here, I'm starting and I'm, and I'm moving the item to the left. So essentially I'm comparing, what I wanna do is I wanna compare with items that are smaller and smaller. So I'm, uh, essentially what I'm doing here is I'm looking at pairs of items in the array. And if the pairs are out of order, I'm gonna swap them. What that's gonna do is that's gonna keep moving that item that I'm inserting to the left until I find the right spot for it. So what do I need to check here? So I need to check if input array j is greater than input array j minus one. I gotta think about this a little bit, because I might have got these backwards. Let's see. Have these backwards, okay. All right, so if the, if the array is sorted, then if I look at any two elements in it that are side by side, the one to the left should be, the one to the right should be greater than or equal to, right? If the one to the left is smaller, right? Let me write this in a less confusing way, right? So let's look at input array j minus one. I'm gonna say if that is greater than input array j. So now, the left side of my expression is the left, leftmost, the, the left part of the element pair, and the right side is the right. 
So I'm looking at pairs of elements. I'm looking at the, uh, the element at j minus 1 and j. If the element at j minus 1 is bigger, then these two are out of order. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to swap them. And to swap these two elements, you know, this is great practice for this. We haven't seen this in a long time. I need to use a temporary variable. I use the temporary variable to hold the value of input array j. And then I assign j minus 1 to input array j. And then I assign, oh, input array to my temp value. So if they're out of order, I'm going to swap. Okay? Let's see if this works. Ah, look at that. Still got it. I can still implement insertion sort without thinking about it for six months. So that's good. Uh, my brain is this, is, this is how I keep my brain fresh. Um, all right, let's, let's look at here inside, let's print this out. Let's print, let's print that out to println um, j. Let's say um, j minus 1 plus j so we see which pairs we're looking at here, right? So you'll see the first time through, and actually, let me print i, too. All right, so the first time through, there's one pair that I have to look at. So that would correspond, let's say the, the array only had two elements, right? I still need to look at those two elements and make sure they're in order. The next time through the loop, I'm moving something from a little farther to the right, so I have to look at two different pairs. The third time through the loop, I'm looking at something a little farther right, right? So essentially, I'm moving things, I'm grabbing something from the, the rightmost, um, I'm grabbing something, the leftmost element of the unsorted part, and I'm sliding it into the sorted part until I find the right spot. What's a small optimization that I can make here? Make this run a little bit faster? Anybody see it? Yeah. Yeah, so essentially, if I don't swap the two elements, I'm done. Right? As long as I maintain the sorted part of the array properly, I don't need to keep, you know, checking all the other parts of the sorted part of the array, because they're already in order. So as soon as I find the right spot for the item, I can stop, okay? Okay. Questions about this? I guess we'll have more time to puzzle over this over the weekend on Monday's homework problem, but questions now about how this works before we talk a little bit about how well it runs. Yeah. Could you solve this problem recursively? Can you sort things recursively? Yes. Can you sort things recursively with this particular algorithm? No. Yeah, because the algorithm operates both on the unsorted and the sorted part of the array, right? So if you imagine if I tried to restart the algorithm on the unsorted part of the array, I still need access to the sorted part. Right? We will see recursive sorting algorithms, don't you worry. In fact, we'll see one today if we have time. Yeah. Not sure. Not sure exactly what you have in mind. If you post that on the forum, we can look at it together. Yeah. Okay. So so let's um, let's try to figure out the runtime of this guy. But let's do it sort of in. in well, first of all, um, let's look at it. Right. Remember Big O analysis? Guys, okay, hopefully, just had a reminder about that on this week's quiz. So who wants to get me started on a conversation about how this might perform? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I see two for loops, okay? The outer one is going over the entire array. And you'll notice that there's no break in the outer one or return. So this outer loop is always going to execute n times. Now, the inner loop's a little trickier, right? The inner loop, um, first of all, it doesn't go over the entire array. It starts at i. Um, so the last time through, the outer loop will execute n, sorry, the inner loop will execute n times, but the first time it only executes once. There's also a break inside here, 
right? So on some level, the performance of this starts to feel like it's dependent on the inputs. But what do you feel like the worst case performance of this algorithm is? Yeah. The whole thing's sorted except the last one goes somewhere else. Okay, well, so if the whole thing is sorted, this is a good, this is a good um, thought experiment, the whole thing is sorted, then I'm gonna break out of this loop pretty quickly every time until I get to the last element, right? So we're close. So what's the worst case input for this? Yeah. Bingo, yeah, if it's sorted in reverse order, then every time I get in here, I've gotta, you can think about it this way, I've gotta drag every element from the unsorted part of the array all the way to the beginning of the sorted part of the array. And then I've gotta run back and grab the next one and drag it all the way back to the, to the uh, beginning of the sorted part. So let's, uh, let's do this for fun. Let's say int uh, count is equal to zero. So essentially we're gonna count the number of steps that this is taking. And every time we do this, we're gonna do count plus plus. And then down here, we'll print this off. Okay, so there that's 18 steps. My array is size eight, okay? Um, let's put this in order. Let's see what happens if we do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight. Now it takes zero steps. Well, that's actually not true. Sorry, I shouldn't put it in here. I need to put it any time I enter this. All right, so now it's seven, take seven steps. I started my sorted part with one element, and every time that inner loop exits immediately because the element's in the right spot. So if it's sorted, I'm in good shape. But what happens if it's sorted in reverse order? Yeah. Now it takes much, much longer, right? And this is, this is basically kind of um, n squared over two, roughly, right? Size of the array is eight, n squared is 64, n squared over two is 32, it's roughly that. If I make this a little bit bigger, let's say I make this zero, negative one, now I see about 45, I'm going close to 50, right? Um, Remember, we don't typically worry about the, the constant terms inside our, our big O's, so this is essentially O n squared in the worst case. In the best case, it's, it's O n, right? So if I, again, if I flip this around and do it in order, then what I'm gonna see is even as it gets fairly large, it's linear, it's O n. Average case performance, anyone wanna guess? Random data? Yeah. Yeah, it's about O n squared. Worst case O n squared, average case O n squared. Right. Um, it's really only in the best case that I get this uh, order n uh, performance, right? That's a special case for this algorithm. Questions about this? I think this is my next slide. Yeah, right, here we go, yeah. What about, okay, so I promise, and when we talked about sorting algorithms, we're talking about both time and space complexity, because they both matter, particularly when we start to sort massive data sets. You want to sort a billion records. It just doesn't matter how long it takes. It also matters how much extra space, how much extra computer memory is it gonna consume. So time complexity for insertion sort, you know, so, so we understand this, worst case O n squared, if it's backward sorted, average case is also O n squared. Best case O n, the array is sorted in the direction I'm trying to sort it already. What about space complexity? How much space, so there's an array of integers that's passed to the algorithm. How much extra space is this algorithm taking up as it runs? Any guesses? Yeah. Yeah, I really just have this temporary variable here. The way I've implemented this, I'm, I'm declaring that temporary variable inside the loop, so, but I could also put it out here. I could say int temp is equal to zero, and then I could just use it in here. It's still gonna work fine. Um, so yeah, I really only have this one temporary verb. The rest of the sort is happening within the array itself. It's actually kind of a nice thing about insertion sort, right? It doesn't consume any extra space. I have the space to store the array, I already needed that, so when we talk about sorting algorithm space complexity, we're talking about how much extra space 
does this need? So space complexity is essentially a one, right? One temporary birth. Questions about this before we move on? Okay, good. So, we're gonna start filling out this table together. I don't know how that just happened. Let me hit the, get rid of that menu again. So for insertion sort, now we know best case, worst case, average case, both time and space. And this is something that we're gonna come back to as we introduce new sorting algorithms into the mix. But, let me point something out. You can prove, I don't know if you do this in 173 or not, but you can prove that even given the, wor like, worst case inputs, the optimal sorting algorithm should never be worse than O n log n. You can prove this mathematically in the worst case. And we should be able to get close to O n in the best case. That's where the uh, data is already sorted. But I can, again, I can prove using math that the optimal sorting algorithm should never be worse than O n log n, even in the worst possible case. So even if you give me a sorting algorithm and I get to choose the worst input for it, the input that it's gonna do the most poorly on, it should still never be slower than O n log n. So our O n squared algorithm is clearly suboptimal. We can do better than this. Okay, before we go on, just to let your brain rest a little bit, I guess, um, I wanna talk a little bit about Java generics. This is like a five minute digression. Um, it's gonna become a longer digression in a couple of lectures when we're gonna talk about using Java generics. But for now, I just wanna talk about what they are. This is also going to, uh, finally, I know some of you have been waiting for this moment, going to explain why you've been getting that warning message on some of your homework problems. Okay, so, we've already talked about lists in class. And this is how we've used them so far. We've declared a list and we've declared a list implementation over on the right side. So this is how you've initialized the list, okay? Here's the problem. When you do this, the Java compiler doesn't know what kind of things you're gonna put into the list. So essentially, when you declare a list this way, what you get is a list of objects. When you insert something into this list, it gets upcast to an object. That's all fine and good. You can put anything into the list you want. The problem is when you go to get stuff out. So here's an example. I'm creating a little list. I add a string, but line 10 is actually not going to compile. We can, or it's not, they're, they're, I'm gonna get a runtime error. Yeah. Maybe if it ever finishes running, I'm gonna get a runtime error. There we go. So you're gonna see I'm gonna get a compiler error here, right? The reason for this is my list, I told Java, essentially I didn't tell Java what I wanted to put in the list. And so what I get is a list of objects. I can add anything I want to it. I can add strings, I can add integers, I can add whatever, I can add old dogs. Um, but when I go to get something out of the list, what I get is an object. Now of course, you guys know this by now, I can force the compiler to do what I want here by applying a cast. So I can do this, and now it will work. I can do system.out.println s, and it's gonna work fine. But think about this from your perspective as a programmer. Now you have to remember what the type is of everything in your stupid list, right? So you may think, oh, this is all fine, right? No problem, but then I come along and do something like this, You know, sorry, I wanna, I've got the, my arguments backward here, right? So I'm gonna put, put it at item. Yeah, there we go. So like maybe your partner for your final project doesn't understand how your beautiful code works or something and they don't realize that this list is only supposed to have strings in it. And so they go and they put an integer into it at the front, all right? And then when you pull it out, you think, oh, well this list is just supposed to have strings so it's okay to downcast it and you get this uh, class cast exception at runtime. This is a runtime error, so this is terrible. So this is gonna cause your app to crash. People are gonna downvote you on the Play Store. This is bad. Okay. Remember, and again, this is fun because it connects with stuff we talked a lot in time about. Java and other languages try to take runtime errors and turn them into compile time errors. 
If I can take a runtime exception and expose it to the developer when they're working on the code, then you can fix it. If your code won't compile and you have to fix an error that prevents it from crashing at runtime, that's a good thing, right? So Java and other languages have been trying, trying to do this. So this is an example, though, of a place where I can very easily end up with runtime exceptions due to casting that I don't want. Okay. So how do I fix this in Java? So Java has a system called generics. And really, when we talk more about generics and how to use them, we're going to point out that this is actually a form of polymorphism. This is a third kind of polymorphism in Java. It's called parametric polymorphism. And what it allows us to do, however, from a user perspective, so this is how you use Java's generic classes. So this is what you typically are going to want to do. This is what's going to make that compiler warning go away. Here's how we declare a list of integers. So I still have my list type, but inside the brackets, okay, I tell Java what type of object that list is going to store. So now I'm saying, I'm creating a list of integers, okay? Then I have my variable name, and then I have new array list, and you can either add the same type here and the same brackets, or there's a new feature in Java now where you can just put two brackets next to each other called the diamond operator, and you get whatever type is from the left side. So on line four, I'm telling Java this is a list of integers I'm creating. On line five, I'm telling Java this is a list of strings. So now, here's the fun part. There's two things that happen that are good. The first thing is, when you compile the code, Java can check to make sure that you're using the list properly. So you say, I'm on a list of strings. Actually, I think this is, I think this is broken still. Let me fix it. Yeah, I need to put my bracket, my uh, diamond operator in here. Okay. All right, so, sorry about that. It's a bug on the slides, but now what happens is, on line eight, when you compile your code, the compiler is actually going to check to make sure that you're adding something to the list that's an appropriate type. So for example, this line of code on line 12, I'm trying to add an integer. The compiler now knows what kind of objects are supposed to be in this list called list, underscore, you know, small case list, and so it can help you. This is a compilation error. It's not a runtime error. The compiler is saying on line 12, you can't add an integer to this list, essentially. Right? So that's a good thing. So now I can go back, and before I deploy my code to, you know, millions of people on the Play Store, I can fix this, and now it works again. Here's the other thing that happened that's also good. Notice what I'm doing on line 10. I'm retrieving an element from the list. And notice that I no longer have to cast it to a string. Before, what I got out of the list was an object, and I had to cast it to a string, and that cast is dangerous, because if I get it wrong, I'm gonna have a runtime exception. Now, Java knows that the items in this list are strings. And so, when I get an item out, a reference, I get a reference to a string. And then I can do, you know, whatever I want with that string. All right, I can say, this is a string, so I can, I can print the length, right? Okay, so when the, the reason I'm introducing this is partly because, I mean, you guys are already seeing this on MP4, I think, um, but we're gonna start to use it at various points in class, right? And so I want you to, to, to see at least how uh, generics um, work when I use built-in list classes. This is also something, again, that you can use if you wanna make those compiler warnings go away. When you don't tell Java what type of list you're using, Normally you get a warning message when you compile your code that says you're using unchecked or unsafe operations. Why does it say that? Because the compiler can't check for you to make sure that you're adding things into the list of the appropriate type. Because you can add anything. It's a list of objects. So again, we're gonna come back and talk more about generics in a week or two. Uh, we'll talk about you can, how you can actually design your own classes to use generics, which is pretty cool. Uh, but for now, that's all I wanted to show you, essentially how to use them, right? So whenever you declare a list in Java, declare it using a type so that the compiler can check for you and make sure that the things you're putting in the list are, are appropriate. Any questions about this? David.
It's a good question. So I, I, I think the reason for this, so the question is, if you should be specifying the type, why does Java allow you to do this? This feature, I think, was only added in, like, Java 7. And so I suspect that before that, um, the code, there, there were, there's code that doesn't use this, right? And so the problem, this is a problem whenever you work on a project, particularly a language. If you come up with a new feature that makes things safer later after the language has already been released, you can't go back and necessarily fix all the code that's already using the old thing. Yeah. So, but, but I would suggest that you just, you know, always use your list this way, right? It is much safer and it's really the right thing to do. You know, it's uglier, right? That's the thing. There's this, you know, sometimes we call this syntax clutter in, in the code. So your, your code is starting to look crazier, right? There's more stuff going on. I've got these angle brackets in there. Like, what the heck is, what the heck is that? Um, it's just Java for you. That's how it works. So, any other questions? Okay, good. So, let's talk about another sorting algorithm. Now we've had a little break. So the next sorting algorithm is talked about in search and sort. Search and sort is an iterative sorting algorithm that has on squared performance in the worst case, and really in the average case as well. And I promise that we can do better than that. We can. We should be able to come up with an algorithm that has predictable O n log n performance. Now, n log n is kind of a weird complexity class. We hadn't talked about it very much before, but at some point I think I pointed out that n log n algorithms are frequently associated with recursive solutions to problems. And when we talk about merge sort, you're gonna see why this is the case, okay? But here's the thing that merge sort, as its name implies, merge sort exploits something about the world that's interesting. So if I give you two arrays, that are already sorted, how long does it take me to merge them together, to combine them into one sorted array? So again, I give you array one and array two, and I tell you they're already sorted. Your job is to create array three that contains all of the elements from both of the other arrays, also in sorted order. So how do we do this? Okay, and it's not that hard. So essentially what I do, the way you can think about it is, I look at the two items at the front. Let's say I'm sorting in ascending order. These are the smallest two elements. I look at the two items at the front of both arrays, and I pick the smaller one. That's the element that I insert into my new array, okay? So here, I'm looking at array one, array two. I look at the first two elements. I compare the first element in both arrays, and I choose the smaller. In this case, the smaller one is one, so I add that to my array. Now, I'm also removing it from the first array, and so everything sort of slides over. So now I look at the next element in both arrays. I've got two and eight. Which one's smaller? Two, okay? So I take two and I stick it into my sorted array. Move everything over. Now I look at five and eight. Which one's smaller? Five. Take it, move it over. Look at seven and eight, which one's smaller? Seven, take it, move it over. Notice that I'm not always taking the same element, I'm not always going back and forth, there's no rhyme or reason to this, right? It doesn't mean I take one from one and one from the other, I'm always comparing, them. that's how I make my choice. Here, now at this point, the top array has the smaller element, so I'm gonna take its element out here. Top array still has the smaller element, bottom array has the smaller element again, and at a certain point, it's possible that one or both arrays will run out of elements. Sorry. At a certain point, it's possible that one of the arrays will run out of elements, the other one will still have elements in it. At that point, it's very easy because essentially, I can essentially take the, all of the remaining elements of that array and just stick it into the sorted array because I know that they're still in order, right? So essentially, at this point, um, the bottom array has run out of elements and I take all the remaining items from the top array and I stick it into my sorted array. Okay, so, what is, well, let's just, let's just look at this, okay? So, what is the runtime of this algorithm? If we just look at it. So I compare, pick one, put it in. 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 Compare, pick the smaller, 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 put it in. What's the runtime of this merging two? Yeah. Yeah, 
it's linear in the size of the final array. So here, the final array has eight elements. I had to do eight comparisons to get to this point. So this is O n. Yeah, that's interesting, okay. So this merging two sorted arrays together is O n. Should we try doing it? Yeah, why not, okay. So I've got two arrays here. Let, let's just by implementing this just so you can see that it's O n. I should have practiced these before class. All right, um, so I need to, I need a return array that's equal to um, the combined size of both arrays, okay? Here I am really not gonna handle corner cases because they're sort of, they're sort of rough. Um, uh, you guys will get to do this on the homework, okay? All right, so I've got my return array, and now I also need two other indices. I'm gonna say first index is equal to zero, and second index is equal to zero. So that's the, that's the point where I am in my first and my second array. So I really have three indices that I need to keep track of. One is where am I putting things in the sorted array, and the other is where's the next element I should look at in both of, both of the other arrays. Okay. So now I have a loop here, and I'm gonna go through all of the spots. I know that I need to put one item from either array into every spot in my return array. So I'm essentially gonna use the return array to drive my loop. Now I've gotta figure out what that item should be. So there are really, I'm trying to think, four cases here. So if first index is equal to first.length, what does that mean? Well actually, let me, uh, let me do the other, let me do the rest of it first. X is equal to second dot length. These, these are some corner cases, that will make more sense in a minute. What's that? Yes, thank you. All right, so I've got four cases here. Two of them are probably kind of easy to understand. So the, the one here says if the spot, if the item in the first array that's at that index is smaller than the item in the second array that's at the index I'm looking at, then I'm gonna say return array i is equal to first, first index, and I'm gonna increment first index. Now, what's my first condition checking? If first index is equal to first dot length, what does that mean? If I get to that point and I'm still inside the loop, what must be true? Yeah. Well, it, it, actually, they, they, they could be the same size and this could happen. What does this mean? Every time I find that first index has a smaller element, I take it out and I move to the next element at first index. But at some point, first index is gonna get to first dot length, and that means what? Yeah? Yeah. Bingo, the first array is out of elements. And that means that I should use the item from the second array. And then I'm gonna bump that. Otherwise, second index is second dot length. Now this, in this case, it means that the second array is out of elements. Okay. And now the only thing I have left to, left to handle here is this case at the very bottom. Okay, so I, I know this is confusing. I know how to do this, you don't yet, so let's just walk through it carefully. So there are four cases I need to check. Either one of the arrays might be out of elements. So that my first two conditions here are checking that. If the first array is out of elements, but I'm still inside the loop, it means that there must be elements in the second array. So I take the item from the second array and I bump the second index. If the second array is empty, it means there must be elements in the first array. And so in that case, I take the element from the first array and I bump the first index. If neither one of those things are true, it means that both elements, both arrays still have elements in them. 
And so here what I do is I say if the first, if the item at the, in the first array at the index that I'm looking at is smaller than the item in the second array, then I use the item from the first array and I bump the first index. If I get all the way down to the final else, it means that both arrays have elements, but the first array doesn't have the smallest element. And so that means I'm gonna take the item from the second array and bump the second index. Okay. That sounded right to me when I explained it to you. Let's see if it's actually, if it actually worked. I do not know why this is so slow today. I'm not happy about this. Oh, I have some sort of bug in the code. Oh, I need new. Ah, okay, good. That looks right. Just m mush with this a little bit. Let's try a case where, um, you know, this is what you do during testing. Let's try some corner cases here. Let's imagine that all the items in my first array are smaller than all the items in my second array. Does it work? Yes. Try the okay. So again, I, I know, you know, I, I, when, when, I, when I taught this for the first time, I was like, does this really have to be so, so it's not complicated. It's just long, right? But this is, this is as clean as I could get it to be. But. We look at the, let, let's go back to our conversation about complexity. What is the runtime of this algorithm? This is not hard. What do you see in the code? Yeah. I see one for loop. How many elements does that for loop iterate over? It's essentially first dot length plus second dot length. That's the length of the array that I create to hold the, the elements that I'm gonna return. Are there any breaks or return statements inside the loop? No. Essentially, I've got to fill a return array that's the size of the two smaller arrays combined. And I do that one element at a time. All I have in this loop is this big, you know, nasty conditional statement. Right? Um, so that's it. So, interesting thing about the world. I can merge two arrays together in ON. Right? Worst case is ON. What's the best case runtime of this algorithm? Also ON. There's no input dependency here. When we looked at insertion sort, we noticed that there was a best case of ON, worst case of ON squared. Here it doesn't matter. There's no break, there's no return, there's no way that that loop cannot execute the combined, you know, size of the first array and second array times. It's always going to do that, right? Average case, ON. Okay. So we're gonna return to this on Monday, but how do we use this to sort? So now we know how to merge two sorted arrays together. How can I use this to build a sorting algorithm? So I've got a building block here. I know how to merge. How do I get to merge sort? Yeah, remember something about arrays. This takes us back to something we pointed out last time about arrays that's interesting. Every subpart of an array is itself an array. So if I take this longer array of eight elements and I consider just the first four elements, that's an array. And if I take that array and break it into smaller pieces, the first two elements of that array are also an array. And if I come down to this smallest part of an array, an array with a single element, that array is also, that part's also an array, okay? Now, what's interesting about this? What's true about this array of size one? Remember, I can, I can merge two sorted arrays together in ON. What's interesting about this array of size one? It's already sorted. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, again, as I, as I imagine breaking this down to smaller and smaller pieces, when I get to the smallest possible subarray, it's already sorted. And so we're starting to see the beginnings of a recursive algorithm here. I can apply the same principle I applied when I worked on trees to figuring out how to sort things on arrays. How do I make the problem smaller? I break the array into sm two smaller pieces. What's the smallest problem that I need to solve an array with one element? How do I combine and then, okay, so the last thing we looked at when we did recursion is how do I combine things back together? Here I do that by using my merge function. 
Okay, so we'll pick up here on Monday. Nothing exciting to announce today. MP4 is out. Please get started. Early deadline is on Monday. I have office hours today, 1 to 3. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I will see you on Monday.